Well, here we are again, our last session, and it's, it's, been, a, it's been a real blessing to, to teach this class and to just to pray for each one of you and pray that what God has for us, because I know that each one of you, God is going to use you as you take these things that you've learned and use them, you know, whether it's a coworker, a friend, a neighbor, a relative, or maybe you don't have any Muslim friends right now, but God's going to bring them to you. If you have an open heart, and if you begin to pray, I guarantee when you pray, God listens. And when you pray, God answers. But the key is we must ask Him. Just ask and say, Lord, put Muslims in my path, and God will do it. And that's where it starts. You know, if we have an open heart, God wants to meet that. And so, so here we are, session seven, and we're going to be doing communicating the gospel, and we're going to... Start off here today with the scripture that I have here at the top of the page. By the way, uh, the outfit I am wearing is from Morocco. And um, <clears throat> the last week I wore uh, a jalaba, which is something traditional to the Moroccan uh, men. This one is, as you can see, worn especially in the summertime because it's short sleeve. But it's uh, especially used by the Tuareg Berbers in the Sahara Desert of Morocco. So this is uh, a type of... Um, the color and the, the decoration and the, the, the kind of outfit they wear. So I just, just thought I could wear this today and um, something different. So here we go. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We have to keep this in mind as we are sharing the gospel with Muslims that the message that we proclaim is foolishness. It is something that the enemy has blinded their minds and the message of the cross, it's something that the unbeliever sees as foolish. Why would God come down and become a man? Why would he go to the cross? It makes no sense. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so we have been called by God not to change the message, but to take the message and communicate it to the Muslim people in the best way possible. So the first thing that we're going to look at today is obtaining salvation. So keep in mind, there's several things I want you to keep in mind. Number one, keep in mind that the Muslims don't believe that God loves sinners. Allah hates sinners and unbelievers. He only loves those who do good. Whereas in Christianity, God hates sin and has holy anger towards sinners, yet He loves them exceedingly. So much so that He gave Himself to save them. Now, first of all, let's look at some verses in the Quran. Surah 2, verse 190. Fight in the cause of Allah, those who fight you. But do not transgress limits, for Allah loveth not transgressors. And Surah 3, verses 31 through 32. Say, O Muhammad, to mankind, if you love Allah, follow me. Allah will love you and forgive you your sins. Allah is forgiving, merciful. Say, obey Allah and the Messenger. But if they turn away, lo, Allah loveth not the disbelievers in His guidance. So there, Allah says, He will love not those who are unbelievers or disbelievers. But we know what the Bible says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world, the world, the entire world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. It was the love of God that caused him to come and to die on the cross. And look at what Romans 5.8 says. I wrote it down here for us. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, Christ didn't die for his friends. He died for sinners. While we were enemies of God, he died for us. And that's how God demonstrated his love towards us. And in the Bible, we have several scriptures where God declares the problem to be spiritual. And I gave you several scriptures here. Jeremiah 4.4, 4, Romans 1.18, James 
4.4, where God says to us that the issue that God has is our sin. It is sin that He hates, and it is the sin within us that needs to be forsaken and repented of. But it's that sin that blocks and separates us from God. Listen to what uh, Donald Barnhouse said. The Bible does not teach that there is no good in man, but it teaches that there is no good in man that can satisfy God. You see, you may, you may run across somebody that says, well, wait a minute, you say there is none good, no, not one, but I know many good people. They do a lot of good things. And a Muslim may say the same thing. They do good things, and it's true. They can give to the poor. They can help the needy. They can build hospitals. They can do a lot of good things. You, you cannot ne negate it and say it's bad. But see, the Bible says, and this is where it hit, he hits it right on the head, it's not that man can do no good. It's that the good that man does is not acceptable to God, and it does not grant him entrance into God's presence. We need Jesus Christ, you see? And that's the key. The second thing that we need to keep in mind in ministering to Muslims is that they don't believe they are born in sin. That is so important. Nor that they are born separated from God because of their sin. In Romans 5.12, it says this, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. And in Romans 3.23, the Bible says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So the moment we are conceived, the Bible says we are sinners and we need a Savior. But as a Muslim, remember, they do not believe in original sin, that a person is separated from God. They simply believe that you are born innocent and you come into this world, and over time you begin to deviate from the way. And so every person, remember, every person is born a Muslim. Don't forget that. They believe that you were a Muslim, but you have simply deviated from the right path, and you need to be brought back to Islam. Okay? The Bible teaches opposite. Thirdly, we need to keep in mind that the Muslims believe in Judgment Day. That on Judgment Day, everyone will be judged by scales. So they believe there's going to be scales. The good deeds versus the bad deeds. In other words, they will gain entrance into heaven by their own efforts, by what they themselves did on earth. It is a reward earned, not a free gift that is unearned or undeserved. Remember the difference between something you earn, a reward is something you did, you worked for it, and you earn it. A gift, you did nothing to deserve it or earn it. It's, a, it's free. It's grace. That is the difference. In the mind of many Muslims, this is important, for eternal life to be a free gift is too good to be true. I've talked to Muslims where they say, that's too good to be true. That God would give us a free gift of eternal life? That I have to do nothing to get it? Yes, nothing. Christ did it all for us. What you need to do is put your faith in God. And I heard a very great description of what is faith. Faith is the hand of the heart. Have you ever heard that? No. It is the hand of the heart. Just simply receive. Because all a person does is receive. But if they don't receive, they have not accepted it and received it. But faith is the hand of the heart. And so it says, in Surah, in the Quran, Surah 23, verses 101 through 104. Then, when the trumpet is blown, there will, be, there will be no more relationships between them that day. Nor will one ask after another. Then those whose balance of good deeds is heavy, meaning they have more good deeds, they will attain salvation. But those whose balance is light will be those who have lost their souls. In hell will they abide. The fire will burn their faces, and they will therein grin with their lips displaced. So the idea, obviously, if you have more good deeds on Judgment Day, you will enter into paradise. And even then, the Quran says, whom God wills. It depends on God. If He wants to, you will go to heaven. If He doesn't, you will go to hell. 
There is no assurance, there's no guarantee. There's no consistency in the nature of the God of Islam. But the Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's so simple. Romans 6.23, it summarizes the gospel. What did you do? You worked. You worked for what? You worked for death. What you deserve and what I deserve is death because we worked for it. We earned it. But eternal life is a free gift. You did nothing to deserve it. You and I should burn in hell. But God has given us a free gift. Completely grace. Completely grace. I did nothing to deserve it. And what does that do as a response in my heart? I want to serve Him for all of my life. I want to love Him. I want to give Him my all. But see, we have to understand the greatness of our sin and of what I deserve so that I will understand the amazing grace. See, amazing grace is only amazing if I understand how great is my sin and how great it cost God. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we know this. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So we can t tell our Muslim friend, you see, if God is going to judge you according to your works, there will always be somebody better than you, and there will always be somebody beneath you. And each person can boast before the other and say, well, I did more than him, I did more than him, and somebody will did, more, did more than you. You see, but on that day when we stand before God, no one will get the glory and nobody can boast. We will all boast in the Lord because we'll say He did it. It's all of Jesus. And that's what God wants. It's everything to His glory. So we need to understand that, that they believe they will be judged by their works. But grace, or rather salvation, is a free gift. Don't forget that. We need to communicate that to them. And these are scriptures to help us communicate that. Fourthly, they don't believe that God made provision for their redemption through the blood sacrifice of Christ on the cross, but that they themselves, through their good works, righteous deeds, can satisfy God and obtain salvation. In fact, their good works can erase their bad ones. In Surah 2, verse 200, 271, it says, If ye disclose or in other words, if you do charity, even so it is well. But if you conceal them and make them reach those really in need, that is best for you. In other words, you do the good deeds without telling anyone or doing it secretly. It will remove from you some of your stains of evil. And it says some of your stains. So I have to ask the question, well, which ones and how many? So we don't know. It's just left for us like that some of your stains of evil. And Allah is well acquainted with what ye do. He's well acquainted with what you do, but I don't know what He's going to remove. The Bible says in Isaiah 64, 6, on the other hand, but we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. Remember, when Jesus came before John the Baptist, and in John 1.29, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist was pointing to the Messiah, that he was God's Lamb, you see. Remember, all, remember how we went through the, 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 the principle of the blood sacrifice, the scarlet thread of redemption. All through history, sacrifices had been made. Lambs had been given. The people's ram, the people's lamb. But now he says, the lamb of God. As if God said, now it's my turn to provide the sacrifice once for all time. To close the book, to finish redemption. It's awesome. And Jesus is the lamb of God. And then in 2 Corinthians 5.21, he says this. For He made Him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. So we can do nothing for our redemption, but God did it. He made provision 
But as a Muslim, God did nothing to provide my redemption. Fifthly, they don't believe that they can have assurance of salvation in this lifetime. My question is, would God want His children, Muslims wouldn't say children, they would say His servants or believers. So if you were to ask them, you would say, let me ask you, would God want His own servants to live their entire life without any hope and joyful expectation of spending eternity in heaven with God? Are you telling me that as a Muslim, Allah wants you to live your whole life without ever knowing when you die if you will enter into heaven or not. You have no idea if you did enough or you're lacking. You don't know. How can you live with hope? How can you live with joy in serving God? See, me as a Christian, I am not telling you as, um, I'm not being proud because actually Muslims have told me, well, you're being proud by saying you're going to heaven. You know. God guarantee, yes, because God's word has given me a promise. See, God has promised us in his word. He who believes in me has everlasting life. You see, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. God has given us his word. And if I don't take God at his word, then I make him a liar. You see, I believe God is true. Don't you, my friend, want to know that you will spend eternity with God? God's word tells us that. So look at this in Surah 14, verse 4. And we never sent a messenger save with the language of his folk. In other words, Allah is saying, we never sent any of the messengers, Moses, Abraham, David, without sending them in their own language. That he might make the message clear for them. Then Allah sendeth whom he will astray, and guideth whom he will. He is the mighty, the wise. Look at what it says. Allah, if he wants, he will make, he will cause people to go astray, whom he wills. It may be you, it may be you. He will make you go astray, and whom he wills, he will guide. So it's all up to him. He is, he's deceiving. Okay. Now, listen to this. And I'm going to read to you that Muhammad himself had no security of going to heaven. This is from the Hadith. And I'm going to read this uh, reference. It's in this book here, Unveiling Islam. Very good book. I, I th think I mentioned it before. I encourage you to, you can order it. But this is in the Hadith. And the reference is volume 5, 266. Muhammad said this, by Allah, though I am the apostle of Allah, yet I do not know what Allah will do to me. Can you imagine? The seal of all the prophets, the best messenger, the final messenger, the one on whom all of Islam rests, when he died, before he died, he said, I do not know what Allah will do to me. I do not know. I have no clue. And so the Muslim has no assurance. But Jesus says this in John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. It's a promise. And shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Beautiful. 1 John 5, 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Notice, Son of God. We must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. You see, the Scripture gives us an assurance that you may know, be certain that you have eternal life. Next, sixth, remember the Muslims believe in a heaven and in a hell. Okay. Seventh, keep in mind the Muslim people are God conscious. They sincerely want to please God by doing what has been taught to them in the Quran. And this is one of those things that makes it easy in a way to talk to a Muslim. Because you're not talking with somebody that 
They don't believe in God. They don't believe in holy books. They don't believe in messengers. They don't believe that God speaks. They don't believe in miracles. They may not believe in Jesus or they just, that doesn't mean anything to me. You're, when you're talking to a Muslim, they believe in God, a God. They believe in the messengers. They believe in the prophets. They believe in Jesus. All of these things. They believe in heaven, hell, all of these things. And they are a God-conscious people. So they are open to talk about spiritual things. And this is a, a verse in the Quran that you may want to write this down, jot it down. That is something for us to know and you may want to keep in mind or write it down or make a note of it when you are talking with a Muslim. But it points the Muslim to the Bible. And we may have gone over this before, but Surah 10, verse 94. Surah 10, verse 94. So remember what we said. The Muslim, remember, they, when they come to the Quran, they sincerely want to follow it. But look at what Surah 10, 94 says. If you are in any doubt, remember now this is Allah speaking to Muhammad and the Muslim people. If you are in any doubt concerning what we have sent down to you, that's an interesting one too. Why, why does Allah say we? I don't know. They're, they have different ideas. Because they don't believe in the Trinity, remember. Allah is one, but he says we. If you are in any doubt concerning what we have sent down to you, then question those who have read the book before you. The truth has come to you from your Lord, so do not be one of the doubters. So the Muslim is told that you can validate this, the Quran, by going to us, the people of the book, because we received the book, which is the Torah, the Zabur and the Injil, before the Quran. And yet, the Muslim will tell you, no, the Bible has been corrupted. But wait a minute, my friend. Do you know what Surah 1094 says? You can read it to them. Now, just, just a tip. Sometimes when you're talking to a Muslim, and you may say, for example, Surah 1094, they may not know what you're talking about sometimes so you if you have a, a Quran on your on your phone or if you have a book or whatever you can bring them the reference 10 remember each surah has a title okay just like we say the book of Isaiah the book of Jeremiah the book of Matthew so for example surah 10 would be the surah of Jonah okay the surah of Jonah because in the beginning of the surah It'll tell you here the title of that surah. Surah 10, Jonah. In Arabic, Yunus. Okay, so you can tell them. In Surah Yunus, or Surah Jonah, verse 94, it says this. Okay, so that's just a tip. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Eighth, an eighth thing to keep in mind is that for a Muslim to obtain salvation, he must believe the articles and the pillars of faith. Remember, we went over those five pillars of faith. He must say the confession of faith. Remember, he has to say that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. He has to try to practice the five pillars of faith as faithfully as possible, do as many good works as possible, and repent when he has sinned. Remember, they believe in repentance. Okay, They believe in repentance. All along in his heart, he says, God willing, my life is acceptable to God, and God willing, he receives me into paradise. He has no assurance, but he says, God willing, he will accept me. He doesn't know. And that's where you and I as the Christian can come and share with them the beautiful assurance that we can have of salvation to those who repent and put their trust in Jesus Christ. Both Jews and Muslims seek to please God in the flesh through doing rather than receiving, by attempting tirelessly to reach up to God rather than Him reaching down to us. See, God bless you. That's what it's all about. All of the religions of the world is man trying to reach up to God. I'm trying to do more, do more so God is satisfied. When God says, I reached down to you and you need to receive, receive. 
Let's read this, Romans 10. Romans 10, verses 1 through 15. Because what Paul the Apostle says in regards to the Jewish people, his own people whom he loved, it applies to the Muslims. And we see that. <clears throat> so Romans 10, beginning with verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, just like the Muslims. They have a zeal. They want to please God, but they, are, they do not know the way to God. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Same with the Muslims. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. You see, it all ends with Christ. See, all of the law, the Bible tells us that all of God's law and all of His commandments were not to be making us righteous, but it was a schoolmaster to lead us to Jesus Christ. He is the end of the law. And we, we, are, coming, we are brought to faith in Christ so that our righteousness is in Christ. Verse 5, For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead? But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, salvation is not that you have to do this, some great thing, go here or go there, but it's simply in your mouth. It's simply faith in Jesus. But remember, this is very severe and very heavy. When Paul the Apostle, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. What does that mean? That He is Lord. He is King. He is God. For the people in Rome, that would mean their death sentence. Because if they did not say Caesar is Lord, they would be put to death. So when we are leading a Muslim to Christ, we are leading them to really count the cost count the cost, that they will surrender their life to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and God in the flesh. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of, pre of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. So the Bible says we need to go. We need to tell them. We need to preach the gospel because if we don't, he says, how will they hear? How will they believe? How will they call unless they hear the preacher? And how will we preach? Unless we are sent. And God has sent us. And so we need to simply obey. Now, I gave you here three different illustrations that you can use because these are illustrations that I use when I share with Muslims concerning our sinfulness and our depravity and how we need Christ to save us. First of all, imagine two people that have fallen into a deep pit. They've fallen into this deep pit. And if one turns to the other and says, well, get me out of this pit, he can't because he's also in that pit just as this, the other guy is. 
One can be rich, one can be poor, one can be old, one can be young. It doesn't matter what they have and, or who they are. One can be intelligent and one not. They are both fallen into that pit. And let me ask you, who is the only one that can save them from that pit? It has to be the person who has not fallen into that pit. It is someone from above that can reach down and do whatever he can do to bring them out of that pit. And it's the same for us. Because everyone has sinned. Each person, whether it's me or whether it's a prophet, we have all sinned. We have all sinned and we are all incapable to save ourselves. So salvation can only come from him who has not fallen. And there's only one who has not fallen into sin. It is God. The Muslim needs to know there is only one who has never sinned. That is God. Everyone else has sinned. Now you're going to get into a debate. They're going to say, oh no, well this and that, this and that. The Bible says all have sinned. Muhammad was a sinner. Why? Because Muhammad asked forgiveness. And so I would ask them, how can you not be a sinner and ask forgiveness? It's, it proves the point. Of course he was a sinner. He asked Allah to forgive him. And so he was a sinner just like any of us. Here's a second illustration. Muslims understand this because when they eat meat, it has to be halal. Now you have halal, which is equivalent to kosher food, okay? Halal food means a meat that was slaughtered by either a Christian, Jew, or Muslim, okay? That meat had to be slaughtered by one of those three religions. So halal versus non-halal meat. So a Muslim is forbidden to eat pork, which is non-halal meat, okay? Pork, they cannot eat it. If a Muslim was offered three plates of meat, but each one had a different amount of pork mixed in with the beef, it would be forbidden to eat, no matter how little amount of pork is in it. You see, if I go up to a Muslim and say, okay, this one has 20% pork, will you eat it? They'll say, no way. This one has 5%. Just a little, will you, will you eat it? No. Okay, this one, it has just 0.5%. Nothing, it won't do nothing for you. Will you eat it? They'll say, no, absolutely not. Why? Because it cannot have any pork in it. It's the same with heaven. You cannot enter the presence of God even if you've sinned once. Once is enough to condemn you to hell. Why? Because God is holy and all sin must be punished. So my friend, if you've sinned once, you cannot enter heaven. You see, it is in the same manner God cannot allow any amount of sin into His holy presence, lest it defile heaven and compromise His holiness. See, we have many times, God forgive us as Christians, we have compromised and not understand the holiness of God. The holiness of God. I mean, I just think of, just think of the seraphim. These angels, or the, I don't even know, they're creatures in heaven, they cannot look upon God. The seraphim, with two wings they cover their eyes, with two their feet, and with two they fly. And they say, holy, holy, holy. It's very interesting. The only attribute in the whole scripture that is said three times. You never see that God has said He is love, love, love. He is merciful, merciful, merciful. He is righteous, righteous, righteous. Nothing but holy, holy, holy. That's very serious. That's very serious. And God, the Muslim needs to understand in his mind, God is so holy that he cannot allow sin into his presence. Every sin must be punished. And so my sin was punished. Your sin will be punished. Either it will be you or it will be Jesus. Which do you want? You see, I've received Jesus Christ, and I have said, I am a sinner, Lord. I receive that Jesus was punished for me. I receive that gift. And God wants to offer you the gift too. You just have to open your heart. But we need to pray because God needs to take those blinders off. Here's a third illustration. A murderer in a court before the judge. If a man is charged with first-degree murder 
and is condemned by the judge to the death penalty for the crime. Do you think the criminal would be acquitted of his crime if he showed remorse and begged forgiveness? So, I mean, just imagine, here's a murderer in court. He committed murder. He's condemned to the death sentence. But he says, judge, he throws himself at the mercy of the judge. He says, I am so sorry. Please forgive me. I will never do it again. Will the judge forgive him? No. He may say, I pray God forgives you. God have mercy on your soul. But this is what the law requires. And because I am a good judge, and because I am a righteous judge, you will pay. What if the murderer promised to do lots of good deeds in order to outweigh the bad ones? Maybe feed the poor, lend money to a family in need, or volunteer his time for community service. So just imagine this murderer says, look, I'll do all these good things so that I can go free. Is that enough? The judge will say, no. You can do a million good things, but you still killed a person. See, that's the thing. You can do all these things, but you still did this. And this, whatever it is, must be punished. Would that be sufficient to clear him of his charges and acquit him? No, absolutely not. What about upholding the law? Isn't there a law of the land? Yes. God has a law too. What about being a just judge? What about the victim's families, the offended party? Okay, so let's say the judge says, okay, I'll let you go. What would that do to those who are the victim's family? You will be, the judge will be mocked and ridiculed and everyone will say this man needs to be thrown in prison. This judge needs to be thrown in prison. He is a, an evil judge, in fact. So imagine if God let people by and did not punish our sin and let us into heaven, he would be an evil God. He would be an evil God. But God is good. And there is a verse in, in the book of Psalms that says, good and upright is the Lord. That's very beautiful and very precise. God says, good and and upright is the Lord. In the same manner, no amount of good works can justify you and save you from the penalty of your sin. The holy law of Almighty God must be upheld and not broken. Every sin carries a penalty. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And in fact, it says in the book of James... If you are guilty of breaking one point of the law, you are guilty of breaking all. And so any person on the face of the earth, have you ever lied? Have you ever lusted? Have you ever had envy? Have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever hated anyone in your heart? The Bible says if you've sinned once, you are guilty of breaking all the law. And the wages of sin is death. The penalty must be paid in full. However... Because of God's nature, because God is good, because God is merciful, because God is gracious and loving, He desires to forgive and justify the sinner and make him acceptable in His sight. See, it's not about you making yourself acceptable. You won't make it. You have to come to God on His terms. You're either going to come to God on your terms or come on His terms. God says, every sin will be punished. But my son, I provided out of my mercy and grace because I desire you in heaven. You see, God doesn't need me, but God wants me. See, there's a difference. If God needs me, needs me then there is a lack in God. There's a lack in God. See, I need water. I need air because if I don't have water or air, I will die. God doesn't need me. God needs nothing. God is all sufficient he is perfect, but God said, I desire you. Isn't that awesome, guys? That God says, I long to have you in heaven with me. Wow. Why? All I can say is, Lord, why? And I can just fall at his feet and just say, I love you. Thank you so much. God, I want to worship you. Why did that man who came back to Jesus, he fell at his feet to say thank you to Jesus? That is our heart. That is the heart of the Christian. 
So we're going to go to the next section here. And this is very important. As we are communicating the gospel to Muslims, we are going to look at our relationship with God and the powerful Christian witness. The first thing is, the Christian is a little Christ, a new creation, and the Christian bears the fruit of the Spirit-filled life. We have to remember this. What does the word Christian mean? It means a little Christ. So when the world looks at you, you should be a little Christ. That's convicting. That's heavy. But let's look. The greatest threat to the church isn't like so many may believe. The religion of Islam or followers or radical Muslims. Neither is the greatest threat humanism, which has permeated our modern Western society. It isn't Mormonism, liberalism, or any other ism. The greatest threat to the church of today is nominal, lukewarm, professing Christians. This is the person who follows a formality and has, like the Bible says, a form of godliness, but denies its power. In other words, everything looks good on the outside, but there is no salvation on the inside. This is the person who goes to church, maybe even serves in a ministry at church, but during the week doesn't open his Bible. This person has no evidence of a Christ follower and has no conviction of sin, no hunger for God, and no burden for lost souls. He has no desire to share the gospel or speak for righteousness' sake, lest he offend people and be hated. There is no commitment to complete obedience to God's word and a life of holy living. Let's look at a few verses, guys. Revelation 3, verses 14 through 17. These were Jesus' last words. One of Jesus' last words here in the book of Revelation to the church of Laodicea. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. See, this is what Jesus said to the church in Laodicea. And this is a very strong word. That he said, you say you have need of nothing. You look good on the outside, but you are lukewarm. And Jesus says, I would desire my, I would that you would be cold or hot but you are saying that you have need of nothing in 2 Corinthians 13 5 the Bible says examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith test yourselves do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified see the Christian is called to test himself I should look at my life and say, do I bear fruit of a Christian? Do I hunger for God? Do I love prayer? Do I love being with the people of God? Do I want to obey His Word? Do I have conviction of sin? Do I want to share the gospel? All of these things, the fruit of a holy life, those are things that I should see in my life as a Christian. If not, he says, unless indeed you are disqualified. And what he means there is you are not saved. That word means reprobate or maybe you are unsaved. And that's why we need to examine, put ourselves under the microscope of God. Matthew 7, verses 17 through 20. Jesus said, Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. 
Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. See, Jesus was very severe in his words. He didn't beat around the bush. He said, every good tree will bear good fruit, and every bad tree will bear bad fruit. Here's a good test. If you were charged with the crime of being a Christian by those who know you the best, would there be enough evidence to charge you? Or would there be lack of evidence? Again, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 12, Paul said this, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. See, Jesus told, um, Jesus, I'm sorry, Paul told Timothy, you have carefully followed. Timothy saw the life of Paul, and he saw that his life had Jesus all over him. In Philippians 2.12, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, people have misquoted or misunderstood this verse. It doesn't say work for your salvation. It says work out your salvation. There is a very big difference. I want you to think about that. We don't work for our salvation because we are saved and I am living my life from a position of being justified and saved. But I work out my salvation with fear and trembling. Think about that every day. God has called me to work out my salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because you fear God. Trembling, why? Because I want to be careful to obey God's word. I don't want to disobey God. And we are to work it out. Our life is to be working out my salvation. Look at a few. I put a, a couple of quotes here from some famous Christians. Susanna Wesley, this is the mother of John and Charles Wesley, the famous preachers of the gospel. She said this, There are two things to do with the gospel. Believe it and behave it. Isn't that awesome? Believe it and behave it. That's it. This is from Leonard Ravenhill, one of my favorites. He said, The world is not waiting for a new definition of Christianity. It's waiting for a new demonstration of Christianity. You see, the world has heard so many denominations and so many Bibles and heard the John 3.16 at football games, basketball games. They've heard it all. They've seen it. What they need to see is, let's see it. They want to see a real Christian living as a Christian should live in love, in prayer, in shining, in loving my wife, in discipling my children, not lying, not cheating, integrity. That's what the world needs to see. But the world is lacking. And it's my fault. It's our fault. Look at what A.W. Tozer said. This is very convicting. He said, what I am anxious to see in Christian believers is a beautiful paradox. I want to see in them the joy of finding God while at the same time they are blessedly pursuing Him. I want to see in them the great joy of having God yet always wanting Him. You see, that's what it is. As a Christian, there is a beautiful paradox. I have God. I already have Him. He's mine. But I am always pursuing God every day, every day. I want more, more, more. I'm not satisfied, but yet I am satisfied. Isn't that amazing? There's a paradox. And then Tozer said this, Religion today is not transforming the people. It is being transformed by the people. Ouch. It is not raising the moral level of society. It is descending to society's own level and congratulating itself that it has scored a victory because society is smiling, accepting its surrender. Wow. We're going, yes, they're smiling. Look at how 
They're accepting us. They're allowing us. Yes, but look at society in the book of Acts. Peter and Paul, they were in prison all the time. My Lord, Jesus, your Lord, he was crucified. Jesus was only on the earth for 33 years, and they crucified our Lord. So we need to ask the Lord, Lord, do a fresh work in us. And if we are not on fire for Christ, then Lord, give me a fire. Revive us. Revive us, Lord. So, these are some things that we need to keep in mind. And these are things that we can share with Muslims as we communicate to them the gospel. First of all, God dwells in His people, not in a holy sight. Look at 1 first, first, uh, first Corinthians, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 3, verses 16 through 17. Remember for the Muslim, Mecca is holy. Because five times a day, every Muslim in the entire world is facing Mecca. That's a holy sight. You see, the Christian, we don't have a holy sight. We don't have a holy sight. Because God dwells in the believer. He doesn't dwell. I don't go to the tomb where Jesus was and get a rock or say, this is awesome, or some holy water, or this is the place Jesus was crucified, and I want to touch it, or I want to be next to it. No, 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 no. That is the religions of the world. We have no holy sight because God is within us. That is the beautiful thing of the new covenant. First, uh, First Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy him. For the temple of God is holy which temple you are. Do you realize that Christianity is the only religion in the entire world where the person's God whom he worships comes and resides inside of him. That's heavy. For the Muslim, it's outward. Hindu, outward. Every, every religion, every, their God is outward, external. Our God is everywhere and within me. He is omnipresent, but he is within the believer. And then the same thing is also said in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. So Muslims do not believe that God literally comes himself and indwells his people, thus transforming the person. Allah is transcendent and separate from his servants. There is no intimacy. See, we have a God who wants to be intimate with us. Muslims believe in physical holy sites and places. When they pray, they need to physically cleanse themselves. Remember, they have to use water when they pray. The Bible says we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. They need a prayer rug or some clean object to pray on. They have holy sites around the world, especially the Kaaba in Mecca, which are sacred, bringing blessing and cleansing of their sins when the pilgrimage is finished. Remember, if a person goes to Mecca and finishes their pilgrimage, all their sins are forgiven. And the Quran says that they are like a newborn child. For the Christian, the Bible says, if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us your sins. The next thing that we want to communicate to them is this, that we can read the Bible and pray to God in any language, in any language. Romans 10, verses 12 through 14. Okay, we read this before. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon Him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. See, I don't have to say the confession of faith in Arabic. Remember, as a Muslim, if me or a Chinese person or a Mexican or an Asian, Russian, anyone wants to become a Muslim, they have to say the confession of faith in Arabic. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved in any language. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 4. 
1 Timothy 2. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. See, God desires all men to be saved. So although the Bible was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, God's purpose was that the whole world would receive the message of the gospel so that all men might believe and bring God the glory He deserves. The heart of God through the Word of God can only be transmitted and communicated through a spoken language. Therefore, God doesn't require everyone to learn Hebrew and Greek if they're going to know God. See, remember, for the Muslim, they have to know Arabic if they're going to know the original Quran, the actual Quran. The language isn't sacred. The God of the Bible and His message is sacred. You see the difference? For the Muslim, Arabic is sacred. The Quran was revealed in Arabic. When a Muslim prays, he must pray in Arabic. We don't have to pray in Greek. We don't have to pray in Hebrew. Even though the Bible was written in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. No. Why? Because it's not the language that's sacred. It's the message. And it's the God that we serve who is sacred. He is worthy. And we, we worship Him. The fact is, 85% of all Muslims in the world cannot even read the Quran in their own native language, which is not classical Arabic. The Quran was written in classical Arabic, and 85% of the world do not speak that language. They have no clue what it says. So when they go to the mosque, Friday after Friday, all over the world, they will sit and they will listen. And when the Quran is being read, they don't know what it says unless they've gone through extensive learning, learning the Quran. But they can't understand it. Okay? That's not their language. If prayer is one of, if not the most, intimate interactions that a human being can have with God Almighty, then would it make sense that God would require you to pray to Him in a language that is foreign to you? If our intimacy with God is shared in prayer, when I pray, then how can I get close to God? If I, I speak English and then all of a sudden I'm going to go into prayer and now I'm going to pray in a language that is not my language. I don't understand it. It would seem that God discriminates and shows favor really to Arab speakers versus non-Arab speakers. And see, the Muslims will boast and say, Islam came for the whole world. Well, if that's the fact, then why is it that the Quran came in Arabic? And why is it that you must pray in Arabic? The Quran did not come for the whole world. It came for the Arabic speakers. God is concerned with the heart, not the words. With our position spiritually, not our position physically. See, we can explain, you can share with the Muslim how we pray. You can share with them, how do you pray? How do you read the Bible? I have had Muslims at our house for a dinner, and we've eaten, and we've prayed. We've had events like Christmas or Easter, and we celebrate Christmas, and we'll throw a little, not party, but a celebration. And we will invite them. And they'll come to our house and they're sitting there and we'll say, okay, we're going to eat. And before we eat, we pray and we give thanks to God. And so I've prayed and I've had people listen. And afterwards they say, that was, that was really beautiful. Do you have that written somewhere? And I say, no. Can you write it down? I say, no, I don't, I don't remember what I said because it all came from my heart. You see, our prayer is not something repetitious. It's not something written down. And God is not so much concerned with my position physically am I doing this five times I have to bend five times I have to bow down five times I have to raise up and stand up no God wants my heart my heart needs to be clean my heart needs to be right with him so that's something to keep in mind another thing that we can share with them is that prayer is an intimate and thoughtful dialogue not a formality and repetitious of words 
Let's read Matthew chapter 6. These are the, this is the text that I will share with Muslims concerning what Jesus taught us about prayer. Matthew 6, verses 5 through 7. And this is really neat because in Matthew chapter 6, there are three principles of the Christian life that Jesus teaches us on. Giving, praying, and fasting. Three. So those three should be in our life. Giving, prayer, and fasting. And the Muslim has no clue. They think that Christians don't give. They think Christians do not pray. And they believe Christians do not fast. Because they give, they pray, and they fast. So I have shared with Muslims, yes, we pray. Really? Yes. Let me read to you what my Lord Jesus taught us about prayer. In verse 5, he says, And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. Now, this is interesting because I see this, I saw this in living daylight. When I lived in Morocco, when it's the time of prayer, you hear it, so they call to prayer throughout the entire city. And wherever the Muslims are, either they will go to the mosque and walk, or they will stay where they are, or sometimes they will pray outside, many of them, in, in a groups of maybe 100 or 200 in the street or in the courtyard or in their shops. So they will just pray right there in the shop or in the bank or in the post office, wherever they are, and pray right there. So obviously, you see them. So obviously, in, in your mind, you can say, oh, well, that man, I know he's a man who prays. He's a spiritual man. But Jesus says, don't pray where men might see you because you want them to see you. So this is very interesting. Then in verse 6, Jesus says, But you, when you pray, in other words, don't do that, do this. When you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Isn't that beautiful? Because God is all about the heart. He wants nobody to see what you do, but to seek Him in private. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. And one of the things that Muslims do in their prayer is they repeat repetitively the surah. It's called Surah Al-Fatiha, which is the first surah in the Quran. Fatiha, they repeat it every time they pray, every time they pray. And God tells us, Jesus says, do not pray repetitiously. Because you think by saying it over and over, God will hear you. So Christian prayer is one of the deepest forms of communion with God that anyone can experience. Jesus taught us to not emphasize on the amount of words we use in prayer or using vain repetitions like a formula that we use in order to sway God to do something. Rather, it is a dialogue where we adore Him, thank Him, confess sins, make petition intercede for people and also and this is something that many christians don't do we listen for god to speak to us in our hearts do you know that god speaks to us see prayer is a dialogue it's not just me talking it's god also wants to speak to us and you can share with your muslim friend that my prayer is not simply just asking we adore him we thank Him. We confess sin. We intercede. See, the Muslim has no clue about any of this. But this is prayer. For Muslims, they pray five times daily and repeat certain words over and over again ritualistically. The next thing about our witness is concerning the Christian martyrs, the past and the present. They give a powerful testimony to Christ. You know, we see in Revelation chapter 11, I'm sorry, not Revelation, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 35 through 40, how men and women suffered, were mocked, were living in the wilderness, were imprisoned 
for the sake of the gospel. <coughs> the multitudes of Christians who have laid their lives down, being mocked, plundered, beaten, imprisoned, scourged, abused, raped, tortured, wounded, mutilated, and more, those which have willfully and joyfully accepted this, rather than deny the name of Christ. This is a powerful and mighty evidence that Christ is not only worth living for, but worth dying for. You see, share this with Muslims. That whereas Islam began weak and grew strong, remember, grew stronger militarily, politically, even in financially, but Christianity started and immediately was persecuted. Immediately they were burned, they were destroyed, they were killed, they were persecuted heavily. And yet they grew because Christ was worshipped, Christ was followed. They believed the message that Christ had died and that He rose again. And people are suffering all over the world, even today. You see that in Egypt. How could people in Egypt, after their, after their churches burned and bombed, continue to go back and worship God? If that happened to a mosque, they would be bombing the churches. They would wipe them out. But do you see Christians in Egypt going to the mosque and burning them and killing them and stoning them? They don't. It is a powerful witness of the testimony of the love of Christ and of Jesus, what He said, if somebody slaps you on the one cheek, turn the other. You see, Jesus said, leave vengeance up to Him. He will, he will take vengeance. Next, the Christian who desires to see Muslims come to Christ should, number one, fall deeper in love with Jesus. Seek the God of the Bible through His Word and know God's Word. I encourage you to know God's Word. Fall in love with Jesus. Number two, ask God to bring Muslims to your path and to place His divine constraining love in your heart for them. Number three, I encourage you to intercede for Muslims always and encourage other Christians to do the same rather than promoting hatred and disdain towards them. Like I've said to you before, there are, there's so much hatred in our world. Now I expect that from the world to hate Muslims, but not from the church. As Christians, we need to pray for them. And so if God brings Muslims in your path, take them to prayer. Take them, take them to the Lord by name and pray for them, intercede for them. Number four, pray that God would send laborers into the Muslim world and intercede for those missionaries actively laboring among them. There's a lot, of, a lot of missionaries out there that you will never meet, that I may never meet. Pray for them. Pray for God's protection on them and pray that God will send more. Pray that God will send us, send from here, missionaries, into those difficult areas. Number five, Continue to learn about Islam and ministries to Muslims. I encourage you to go over the class notes. At the end of these notes, I gave you websites. Okay, I encourage you to continue to try to learn more and grow. Number six, seek. Notice, seek. So it's something that you have to do actively. Seek to befriend Muslims and get to know them. Greet them in public and acknowledge their holidays. Remember, we go over your vocabulary, okay? Assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, assalamu alaikum, okay? Greet them when you see them and acknowledge their holidays. Ramadan is coming up, acknowledge them. Say, Happy Ramadan, Happy Ramadan. If you have any Muslims you know at work or school, invite them out for a meal or coffee. Or even better, to come to your home so they can see how a Christian family relates. See, remember, if, if we're always here and they're always there at an arm's distance, how are they ever going to know what a Christian is like? How are they ever going to know how do you relate to your wife? How do you relate to your children? How do you pray? What do you do? What is your home like? You know, they don't know. Number seven. Acknowledge them on Muslim holidays, especially Eid al-Fitr, which is the feast of breaking their fast, the celebration of the end of Ramadan. 
and Aid El Adha, which is the Feast of Sacrifice, which occurs about 70 days after Ramadan ends. Okay, so 70 days after Ramadan ends is the Feast of Sacrifice, which is also called the Big Feast, which is the commemoration of Abraham's offering his son and God's providing a ram. And remember, that's when they sacrifice sheep. Wish them a happy holiday. In Arabic, Aid Mubarak. Okay, if you want to memorize that, you can say that in Arabic. That's even better. Aid, Aid Mubarak. Aid Mubarak. There it is, okay. Aid is holiday, and Mubarak is happy or blessed. Okay, Mubarak. I encourage you to seek ways to become all things to all men. Remember what Paul said? I have become all things to all men. For example, in Morocco, it was common on their holidays to bring us baked goods and invite us to share in a meal with them. We also learned to bring them things on our holidays or invite them over for a meal and share with them why we celebrate. So they would do that to us and we would do that with them. Number eight, be friendly. Be friendly. Take time to say hello. Give a smile and be ready to receive smiles. Men greet the men. Women greet the women. Those of opposite gender can greet if in a mixed group of people with a verbal greeting but not in a handshake. So if there is a husband and wife, you can greet the wife by saying hello, salam alaikum or hello, whatever you want, verbally, but not with a handshake. Men, you greet the men, and a woman can greet a woman. But you would not shake the hand. If a woman, a Christian woman, would not shake the hand of the man. Okay? Unless that Muslim offers you their hand. Then that's different. Okay? Same with a Muslim woman. I would greet the man and say, Salam Alaikum. And I would say to her, Salam Alaikum. If she, if she reaches out her hand, then I would greet her hand. Okay? I would extend it. Because it all depends on their convictions, what they feel, how they feel. Okay? Uh, with familiarity comes the traditional Arab greeting, cheek to cheek on both sides for men and women. Okay, this is, this is how they are in the Middle East. You may have seen it in movies, but this, this is where we get in the Bible, greet each other with a holy kiss. Because in the Middle East and all through the Muslim countries, that's how they greet. You know, so if I see a Muslim friend of mine or a Christian Arab, that's how I will greet them. I will come and I will shake their hand and then I will... We will go on both sides of the cheeks and, and kiss, you know, and, and many times you will even hug. There is a lot of affection, you know, a lot of affection and a lot of a love. Women are more prone to greet with kisses on both cheeks. You will see that often. Okay, now some do's and don'ts, don'ts in Muslim evangelism. <coughs> so these are some very practical things, okay, I, I want to give you. Number one, speak the truth in love with respect and meekness. Keep that in mind. Number two, know your Bible. Okay, these are things we've gone over. Number three, speak with boldness and authority. Okay, don't be intimidated when they say, well, your Bible is corrupted. You can't trust it. We need to stand on the Word of God. This is what the Bible says. God's Word does not change. God says, my Word endures forever. God's word says heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. We need to stand on his word. Stand on the word of God. Remember that multitudes of saints have spilled their blood in standing for and preserving the Bible. Our Bible is awesome. Our Bible is holy. God has given us his word and has pre preserved it for thousands of years. And Christians have spilled their blood to give us the word of God. So we need to stand on it. Number four. Focus on the major issues and not the minors. Okay, it is very easy to get off onto these minor issues and start talking about things that really don't matter. For example, major, issue, major issues. Who is Jesus and what did he do? Who is Muhammad and how do we know that he's a prophet? Is the Quran the word of God? For that matter, is the Bible the word of God? Why is it or why isn't it? Why do you say the Bible is not the Word of God? Well, let's look at that. Okay, go over your class notes and remember the things we talked about. 
How do you obtain salvation? How is a person saved? How, my friend, do you get into heaven? Well, I just, my good deeds need to outweigh my bad deeds. But the Bible says all have sinned. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. There's nothing you can do enough to gain entrance into heaven because you, you, the wages of sin is death and there's a penalty for your sin. Why the blood atonement? Why does the Bible tell us that the only way to enter into God's presence is by the blood of the Lamb? Why did Jesus die on the cross? Ask them, why did Jesus die on the cross? Number five, commend them for their devotion to Allah and their spirituality. Commend the Muslim for their sincere desire to seek the truth. I have told Muslims, you know, I want to commend you because I know that you seek God. I know that you want to pray. I know that you want to do what is right, and I commend you for that. I see how devoted you are. Rather than just bashing them, I can commend them, and then I can dialogue with them, and I can share my faith with them. Number six, don't laugh at their beliefs that they express to you, just as you wouldn't want them to laugh at you. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. And now there, are, there have been times where I have spoken to a Muslim, and there were times where in our dialogue, there, we're talking about stuff, and it leads into some, some topic, and they will say something, you know, Muhammad said this, and you know, the hadith says this about Muhammad, and it was something that almost made me laugh because I can't believe that they said that. You know, and I had to just, you know, really just hold it and just say, you know, God, you know, help me, strengthen me because I want to laugh, you know, because it's so silly. But he really believes this. We have to remember that he really believes this or she really believes it. But we have to be careful. Number seven, ask them questions about their faith and practices. Remember, I always encourage you, ask them questions, questions. Muslims will like the fact that you are inquiring and not condemning or criticizing them. See, it's a world of difference when you are asking them and inquiring from them versus condemning them or criticizing them. Now, there's something... Um, okay, yeah, this is going to lead up to this, actually. It just popped in my mind. Number eight, don't use a Bible when you are speaking to a Muslim that you have written in when sharing with Muslims, but rather a Bible that is unwritten in, okay? That's what I encourage you to do, and I, I've shared that before because they see it, you're saying it's the Word of God, so for them, at the moment, okay, while they're not a Christian, they do not understand. They do not understand how is it that you are writing in the Word of God which is holy, which you love, which is God's Word, and why are you writing in it, okay? So when I do ministry with Muslims, I always have a, a Bible that is clean or unwritten in, okay? I use this one a lot when I'm with them, okay? Now, another thing is, if you have a Muslim in your home, or with, if you are with a Muslim sharing, respect the Bible. So I will not put it on the ground. Hold it, okay? And even respecting their Quran, Okay? I will not, don't put it on the ground. You know, keep it up high or hold it in your hand. Okay, so those are just some tips, just some tips to keep in mind. Be aware when handling it or giving it as a gift to use the right hand. The right hand for them is the hand of honor. And so you always shake with the right hand. You eat with the right hand. And if you give a Bible, you give it with your right hand. And Muslims many times understand it. Like I said, it's so precious that I will often... I will kiss the Bible and I will give them this as a gift. Number nine. If inviting a Muslim to your home for a meal or taking them out to eat, be sensitive to them. <coughs> Excuse me. Only serve or eat kosher food, in Arabic, halal, or lawful foods. No pork, no ham. So keep that in mind, okay? Halal foods. Number 10, be sincere with them. If you don't know the answer to a question, 
Just tell them that you will research and find it out. See, many times, sometimes Christians will, you know, either we end up lying, which you don't want to do, or making up an answer. You don't want to do that. If you really don't know the answer to their question, or they say, there's a contradiction in your Bible. This says that, and this, and that, and this. If you really don't know the answer, say, you know what? I'm going to find out, and I'll come back to you. Would you like me to give you an answer? Sometimes they really are not interested in the answer, and they just want to argue and debate. Other times, other times I know the answer, and I will explain to them the answer, and they will say, no, no, that's not what it says. And I will say, look, okay, you asked me, you said this is a contradiction, and you're saying this is what it says. I'm giving you the answer. The problem is you don't like what my answer is. So I'm sorry. This is all I can give you, and this is the answer. Okay? So, for example, this is a big one. Well, show me, Jesus never said he was God. He never said, I am God. Okay, I give it to you. You're right. He never said those three words, I am God. But I'm going to show you that he was God based on what he said and what people did. Okay? When he came to Thomas and he said, my Lord, my Lord and my God, and it says he worshipped him. In the boat, when he said to the sea, be still, be at peace, it says that they worshipped him. When he stood before the Jews and he said, before Abraham was, I am. And they took up stones to stone him. Okay, several occasions, Jesus declared his deity and he didn't condemn it. When Thomas says, my Lord and my God, he didn't say, hey, be quiet, that's blasphemy, don't say that to me. No, he said, blessed are you, but more blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Okay, Jesus gave him a blessing. Now, is Jesus a true prophet or a false prophet? They will say he's a true prophet. Okay, then why did Jesus bless Thomas after he just called him my Lord and my God? You see, he's a true prophet. So Jesus wouldn't lie. So be sincere, but if you don't know the answer, go and find out. Number 11, express your love for the Muslim people and interest in the religion. Tell them that you will pray for them. You know, I try to do that. I try to say, you know, I, I want you to know that we love the Muslims. And you know what? Maybe you will, never, maybe you will not get to share anything with them, but they're going to go away and they will remember what you said. I love Muslims. Who, just think, just think, who has ever told a Muslim, we love Muslims? Nobody. You may be the only person. So, when we do that, this is what we want to do. It's, it's, it's the love of Christ that's in us. So tell them that you will pray for them. If there ever arises an occasion for you to pray for a Muslim that you know, maybe there's sickness in their family. One of them are sick. Maybe there's marital problems, etc. Anything, pray for them. Guys, I have, I have some examples of that. So we have... A family that is from Morocco living here. They live in Moreno Valley. Maybe he's going to watch this. And they are not Muslims, but they are not Christians yet. And we've had very good discussion. And we've become close to their family, him and his wife, and they have for many years tried to become pregnant. They want to have children, and they couldn't. Well, one of the occasions... I'm not sure if they were at our house or we were at their house. But we said, can we pray for you? Prayed for his wife, Muna. And we said, Muna, can we pray for you? Because we believe that our God hears and he answers prayer. So we prayed. And she got pregnant. Okay? We prayed for them. Here's another example. My wife has a friend that she got close to, one of the, the many friends in Morocco, she still is in contact with my wife. And she called her on one of the, the, app, the apps on our phone. It's called WhatsApp. What's up? She called my wife on the phone and she said, Rosalie, I want to talk to you. 
because I remember how you raised your daughters and I'm having problems with my daughter. A Muslim lady is calling from Morocco to United States of America to talk to a Christian. Remember, it's a, for a Christian, this is an infidel. You believe in the Trinity. You believe Jesus is the Son of God. But she's still calling because she sees something in her that they don't have. And she asked my wife for counsel. And my wife was able to share with her this and that, this and that. That, see, it's, it's one thing you can, you can say A, B, and C, but it's another thing when you live it and there is a tangible Christianity in your life. Now you're getting to the nitty-gritty. And you know what? We're not forcing it upon her. She's heard many times. We've shared with them. We've shared with them. We've had discussions with them, sitting in our living room with our tea and eating bread and oil. But we know one day, God willing, they will come to Christ. And they will know that we love them. We love them. But I want to encourage you, pray for Muslims and love them. Number 12, give God's blessings to them, especially if they curse you or they ridicule you. Remember, God says, bless your enemies. Do not curse. So say, God bless you. God bless you. I love you. God bless you. Do good to them. Treat them with love and with kindness. And number 13, preach the gospel. Be unashamed. We have to be unashamed. Be willing to take risks for God. Lead them to the cross. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Remember, guys, we cannot, you're going to learn all of these things, but in the end, it's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes the Christian and empowers him and gives him the words, and then he shares. But don't worry. Let the Holy Spirit speak through you. You can't figure out, oh, wait, what am I going to say? Am I going to say this? Am I going to say that? No, let the Holy Spirit give you the words to say, and you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Trust Jesus, rely on the Holy Spirit, and He will fill you. He will fill you. Remember, you might be the only Christian, the only genuine Christian that God ever places in a Muslim's path. Remember, especially here in the United States. It's not like when I lived in Morocco, but in the United States, Remember that as a Muslim, they come across a lot of Christians in their mind all the time. And they've seen this person do that, and this person drinks, and this person sleeps around, and then he's a Christian. This guy, I know he goes to church, but he, does like, he talks like this, he does this. They're seeing all of that. But you be that genuine Christian that they will see. When that Muslim steps into eternity and stands before the glory of Christ and judgment, what will they say about your witness to them? Will they say, He loved me and showed me the truth in Christ. He cared or she cared and went out of His way to demonstrate it. He was just like Jesus. Or will they say, He was no different than anyone else. He treated me the same way everyone else treats me. He never told me about Christ. I didn't even know He was a Christian. How many people can know for years a person and never even knew that they were a Christian. See, there's, there's two kinds of people. You can be a really good person and never lie, never cheat, but you never share the gospel that you are a sinner and Christ died for you. Repent and believe. You're not going to lead anyone to Christ just by living a good life. Or there's the person that preaches, 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 but their life, is dark that's not going to get anyone saved see we need to have both we need to live the life and we need to share the gospel with our words so it needs to be both together now we still have some time all right i wanted to share with you a couple of points from this book because i thought they were very good very practical once again, the book Unveiling Islam by Ergun Mehmet Kanner, last name C-A-N-E-R. And these were, again, some cultural things in ministering to Muslims, some things that are very practical. 
Um, he talks about shaking. When you shake, don't shake with your left hand. We went over that. Shake with your right hand. Calling a Muslim brother. Okay, now I have heard this before, and this is, <laughs> this is, fu this is funny to me. When I've shared with people or been with other groups that are sharing the gospel, and they'll say, you know, brother, when that person is not a brother, be careful that we don't say brother or sister or bro, you know, bro, you know, we're very flippant because we say it in church and then we go outside of the church and we're sharing the gospel and we call him bro. Well, he may not be a bro yet, so be careful. Okay, well, we sometimes people can do that with Muslims and say, you know, my brother. So, no, they're not my brother. I always will say my friend or call him by his name or her name. Okay, but you can refer to the Muslim as my friend which is a positive social statement that does not assume agreement or of philosophy or belief. Accepting hospitality. It's so important. If a Muslim wants to invite you into their home, accept their hospitality. He says in here, family members often remove their shoes immediately upon entering, and the Christian guests should follow suit. The key is if you ever are going into a Muslim home, do as they do. That's what I always tell every, you know what, the easiest way is do as they do. You see them walk, you see them put their shoes down, you put their shoes down. You see them going, they wash their hands, you wash their hands, okay? You're not, now it's, you're not doing something like they're going to pray the Muslim prayer and then you pray. No, I'm talking about cultural things. They take their shoes off, you take your shoes off, okay? If the men say, okay, let's go sit in this room, you go sit in that room. The women say, let's go sit in this room, then you follow, the woman follows the woman, Okay? Eat everything set before you. Now, this can be difficult. But this is actually in the Bible too, guys. Yeah. Eat everything set before you, even if you do not know the nature of the food or its source. Middle Eastern food is delicious and will not harm you. He's right. Thanking the Muslim and complimenting on the food will be a great help and eventual witness. Extending hospitality. It's like I said here. We should extend hospitality, not only accept it, but extend it. Um, and he, he talks about, be careful about what kind of foods don't offer pork. Explain to your guests, if they're at your house, that you offer thanks before the meal. Okay, and now that's something that I will do, and I will pray. And thanking the Lord, using the term Lord, okay, when I speak to God. Well, you can say God or Heavenly Father, but Lord is a very good term to use. And they can, you can explain what Lord is. Okay. Um, he says, We, the authors, are certainly not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but presenting it during grace abuses the privileges of prayer. Okay. He said, Be careful that when you give thanks for your meal, that you don't use that to preach the gospel to them. Okay. Sometimes Christians have a tendency to make their prayer like a sermon, okay? Or I've been in prayer meetings where I'm praying, or somebody's praying, rather, and they're trying to say something to the person through their prayer, by their prayer. That's not time for that. That's not what prayer is for, okay? Prayer is not meant to be a sermon. You know, in my home, we usually will pray and give thanks, and it's, it's fairly short. And I, I even teach my kids. You know, that's great. We, you want to you pray for, you know, all these things, grandma and, you know, the people over there and this... But let, we're giving thanks for the food so we can eat because mommy's made a hot meal and we don't want it to get cold. <laughs> okay, but it's just, it's just something to keep in mind. We're giving thanks for the food and we're giving thanks to God. Speaking with the opposite sex, it's very important that you keep it men with men and women with women. And especially in our culture, you know, Americans can have a tendency where it's very cross, you know, we cross. And you cannot do that in the Muslims, with the Muslims, Okay. Um, rushing to evangelize. In their eagerness to win Muslims to Jesus Christ, Christians sometimes rush to a gospel presentation within minutes of introduction. And confrontational evangelism may indeed be an appropriate and effective means of witness at some point. The authors of this book have been trained in virtually every witnessing method, and we are rarely without a gospel track. In the Islamic community, however, the Christian must earn the right to be heard. Muslims are immersed in a heritage of enmity against Christians, 
and care must be taken to establish a connection across the divide. This slow process of building relationship explains why Muslims do not come to Christ as frequently as do those from other faith systems. You see, with the Muslims, it often is a slow process because they need to, you need to earn their trust. Okay? A vast difference, he says, exists between using opportunities that God provides to share our faith in Jesus Christ and forcing a door of opportunity. Particularly in witnessing to a Muslim, one must use discernment in knowing how and when to share one's faith, seasoned with grace. So we have to just always be led of the Holy Spirit. He goes on, he talks about avoiding political arguments. We have to avoid that. Many times there are, the Muslim may want to go into talking about Israel, and it's easy you can go into talking about Israel and the Middle East situation. Stick to the main issue, the main issue of Jesus Christ as Savior and why you need Jesus Christ as Savior. Another one, patriotism versus evangelism. Patriotism versus evangelism. He says, defending Christ does not mean defending a national foreign policy. You see, I, there were times when even I was in Morocco and the Muslim, I would, there was a guy I'd go to the bank and he would always put down President Bush. Every time I was there, he was like, he would say, every time I came, hey, Mr. Bush, how are you doing? You know, and then he would start putting down the United States and different stuff. You know, you're doing, look at what you're doing over there. You know, I could get into this discussion, but where is this going to lead me? I am a Christian first before I'm an American. Okay, I am a Christian. You know, so remember that. He says, be candid about the sins of supposed Christians. Every intelligent Muslim remembers that Pope Urban II called the first crusade into being at the Council of Claremont in 1095. It was in 1095 that the Pope in this council called the first crusade. And so all Muslims have this in their mind, the first crusade. This event remains a dark chapter in history when ostensible leaders of faith declared a Christian jihad. So we have to be candid. Yes, our history has a lot of stains. There were a lot of things done in the name of Jesus Christ, but I don't defend it. That was sinful. But let's talk about the Bible. Let's talk about what did Jesus do. Let's talk about what did Jesus say. That's what stands between you and eternity, you see, not history. Remember what conversion may mean. And this is uh, my last point here. Remember what conversion may mean. He says this, In America, a conversion to Christ seldom destroys the new believer's family relationships. Elsewhere, conversion often means rejection by family, expulsion from a country, and in some cases, facing a possible death sentence. Even while remaining gently firm about the Muslim's need for Christ, Christians must understand a Muslim's hesitation to convert because of the implications. Yes, if he understands that coming to Christ, it might mean his life in a severe case. It might mean divorce. It might mean losing his family. His father may kick him out. It may mean his job, losing his job. It may mean a lot of implications, so be aware of that. Islam's complete rejection of a Christian convert alters that person's entire life, affecting his heritage, inheritance, family connections, and friendship. Christians in Islamic countries may face torture and imprisonment or be destitute without home, job, and land. but I never water down the gospel. Jesus said, if any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. We have to know that. Luke 9.23. Jesus said it. This is the gospel. We lay it down. We come in love, but we share the gospel. And we pray that God will, will save them. And remember, it's the work of the Holy Spirit. In the end, it's not you you can share and you, can, you may 
debate you may present, but it will be the Holy Spirit that's going to take your words and save that soul. You have not been called to save them. You have only been called to clarify, to tear down misbeliefs and misconceptions, and to build blocks of understanding and explain the gospel. But that's it. You are a messenger to give the message and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. That's it, guys. You are a messenger. So we, we come to the end of our class. Now at the end of our notes here, I gave you um, my email address. And I will be sending you guys um, when we have main events and when we have different things that are going to go on with Muslim ministry. Okay. So any questions or comments, you can write me. Okay. And I will try to get back to you as soon as possible. Please keep our family in prayer and the ministry of equipping the saints to reach Muslims in prayer as well as open and effective doors to reach the Muslim community around us locally. Please pray for the ongoing ministry also. I covet your prayers to pray for Morocco and the evangelism and the church planning there by the missionaries. That's a personal request. But keep that in prayer. And you know that we go every other Friday. So I also gave you a sheet there which has the dates and the locations. Okay, now... I will, I will send you an email, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'll send you a text. And on the text is when we, we give you the mosque, okay? Just to confirm. So that sheet of paper, go by that. But I will, when I know that you are coming with us, you just respond to my text and let me know that I will be there. I want to come, okay? So it, it normally is every other Friday, okay? And we normally, we meet at a Denny's, at a particular Denny's, and it's on that sheet of paper that I gave you. And we meet there with another, uh, a few other uh, people that join us, okay? There is a brother that is, does the Muslim ministry in Southern California. He comes with us. And uh, he's the one that I get all of my resources from. And we go to a mosque, okay? So there are about 14 mosques within a 10-mile radius from here, okay? So every other week, we go to a different mosque, okay? So if you can come, it's normally Friday. Normally, we meet at 11.30 to about 12.30, 1 o'clock at Denny's. We meet there, and then we pray if you want to have lunch or a drink or whatever or not. And then we go to the mosque. So normally at the mosque, we're there by 1, 1 1.15, okay? And then we're there till depends on God, okay? You might be there an hour. You might be there two hours if you have the time, okay? If you can only come for just a, a portion of time, that's great. If you can stay the whole time, that's great too, okay? So whatever you can do. If you can't, then just pray for us. There are also going to be events that we have on the weekends, okay? We will have um, in this summer, there's always a festival in Anaheim, okay? A big festival. Sometimes there's two different Arabic festivals in Orange County, where we will go and we will share the gospel. We'll have a, a table outside. Um, we go inside. Outside, we're giving tracts, DVDs, Bibles, okay? And it's, it's a wonderful experience. You get to meet the Muslims. And the same thing at the mosque, okay? Um, what else? So anyways, I will be in contact with you, and I'll put you on the email list, and then you'll also receive texts if you, if you can go to the mosque on uh, every other Friday. And I also gave you some recommended sites for further study if you want. Um, <clears throat> please write this down. Oh, okay, actually I gave you that one right there. Okay, that's... Let me just double check. Okay, yes, good question. How, she said, how, do the woman, how should she dress as a woman? Okay, so normally uh, sleeves and then either pants or a skirt and a shirt or blouse that preferably covers your back. And then, yeah, hair, hair back, so hair tied, yeah. And, um, actually, since we're talking about all that, yeah. Is it okay 
Absolutely. 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 Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Nobody has to do anything. That's the beautiful thing. So if you come on a Friday, obviously, you know, you know, you guys have never done this before, except for my brother coming one time to the mosque with us. But you come and observe. Stay there. Stay next to us. We, we have teams. We break up and be there and let the Spirit lead you. You're going to have tracks. We're going to give you literature to give out. You know, so as they come out of the mosque, you know, I'll say, God bless you. Can I offer you a gift? God bless you. Can I offer you a gift? You know, and we offer them as they're walking out. Some will say, oh, thank you. You know, many will say thank you and they'll smile. Others will say, what is this? And then you can say, well, this is the life of Jesus Christ or this is the gospel of, of Jesus. Why are you giving this? You know, do you believe Jesus died on the cross? And then they might ask you a question. Then they'll get into it with you, you know, and then you can answer. But if you don't feel comfortable, just stay with us and just watch. Just watch, you know. And that's the wonderful thing. You can just watch, and then as you feel led of the Spirit, then you can engage with conversation, you know. So, yeah. I have yeah. Um, what about if that Friday it rains? Because I know we're going to be standing outside. We still go, right? Um, so, once I'm in contact with you through the text and I know who's coming, mm -hmm. I, will, I will be contact, contacting through text. So, I will let you know. I mean, really, unless it's like pouring we wouldn't go. Okay, but if it's... What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to be in contact. Yeah. So once I send you guys the, the texts, okay, on your phone numbers, if I hear from you saying, I want to come this coming Friday, then I know to be in contact with you. Okay, because we'll do it in a group. This coming Friday, we are going to go. Yes. Yeah, this coming Friday. Um... So I'm just going to pull up this website. Just I need to make sure. I want to give you one more website. Okay, yes, this is it. This is awesome. Okay, so the first website that I gave you there, answering-islam.org, that has everything. Okay, that is... That is the website that is um, put out by Jay Smith. He's one of the uh, renowned debaters, uh, evangelists to the Muslim world. He's an American, and he lives in London. And he's in the park at uh, Hyde Park there on Speaker's Corner. They have a place which has been there for a long, long time where people can publicly preach and say anything they want, and then they have crowds of people. You can watch it on YouTube and see Jay Smith. Just type in Jay Smith and watch the debates that he has there. Okay? But that's his website right there. And he has every topic. You go to the index to Islam, and it has everything on everything on Islam. Everything. Okay? The 30daysprayer.com. I encourage you to go there. I was looking at it this morning, and I'm going uh, to order. That's where you can order the prayer booklet, which is the booklet for every day in Ramadan. So you can pray for a country or a people group or a subject. And then it even has uh, for kids. So I'm going to order one for my kids so I can go through it with my children. Okay, you can order it. Did you? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They have a lot of resources there. So just go on, check it out. The ministry to Muslims.com, that's the local ministry that I am connected with. This is uh, Brother George Sag out of Calvary Chapel, Anaheim. He's the one whom I get all of our resources from, and he's the one that hosts a lot of these events when we go out to festivals and to the mosques. Okay, Search Truth is an online Quran, Search Translations. Now, sites for Arabic-speaking Muslims. So these websites are all in Arabic. So if you meet a Muslim or know of someone or want to give somebody to go and look it up, Give them this, islamexplained.com, 
and this one. Islamiyet.com. Okay. Islamiyet. So all of the whole website obviously is all in Arabic and it has TV programs, articles, a lot of videos of Muslim scholars, people that they will know that are famous and well known saying something about Islam that maybe they have never heard in their life. There's a lot of things out there. They have no clue coming from their own. It's like if somebody came and then they, they, you went to a website and you saw what our pastor taught and then Chuck Smith teaching and then John MacArthur teaching and then Rabbi Zacharias and all these people, Billy Graham saying things and then you're just like, going, what? They said that? That's just what they will see. Okay. And then other things on subjects on Islam coming from their own scholars and then a lot of other things. Okay. So... That's it. Any questions? Question, because I'm kind of confused. Um, first of all, thank you for this. This is awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, I have a question on how they believe they're saved or their sins are forgiven. Right. Because I've heard like four or five different ones. Um, and is it like when you ask a Christian, like how are you saved? And then you tell you through a couple of different denominations will tell you different answers. Because I've heard from them Right. Uh, or when I asked the Iman, he basically said that you just ask for forgiveness and, and, and Allah will forgive you. So I'm kind of confused. Is it all of the above or are they kind of mixed up? Or what is okay, the now there's a difference between how they are saved and how they are forgiven. forgiven. Okay, so for a Muslim, if they repent of their sins and they ask Allah sincerely, Allah forgives them. And, and now this is and now this, let me say a, another thing, a side note. The Quran says different things as well. So the Quran also says that if they do good deeds, it it erases bad deeds. So it says that, but it also says if they repent, God will forgive them. Now, how they are saved, they have no assurance of heaven. So they must do these things, all these things, and that's why they say God willing they will enter heaven. So they're hoping that they will make it to heaven, but they have no assurance of salvation. So there's no guarantee because Muhammad was not guaranteed. Even jihad, right? Even, well, jihad, jihad, the Quran says in jihad, they will enter paradise. So that's actually the one guarantee. But Muhammad didn't even die in jihad. Muhammad just died of a sickness. So, yeah. What's the best food? Yeah. Arabic food? Arabic food. Mine, there's so much. There's so much. There's so much. Yeah. My, my favorite food, obviously, I, I ate mostly Moroccan food. So, but my favorite food within the Moroccan genre was um, a tagine. And a tagine is actually the name of the actual plate because it has like a cone top like this. And then it has a bottom dish. So the top goes on like that. And it looks like a triangle. It goes, but the meat is cooked there, and there's there's various different kinds. But I really like the one that's beef, made with prunes. So there's a prune, and there's a type. It's kind of a sweet, savory taste. It's really good. Yeah, <laughs> it makes you hungry. <laughs> also, when I come this Friday, sorry about that. Yeah. And I wear my Jesus shirt that says Muhammad is dead and Jesus alive. <laughs> Um, no. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's another thing, you know, when you are doing ministry to Muslim, I mean, it's funny that we're laughing about that, but that's a, it's a good, good issue is that, you know, you don't need to do things like witnessing with the t-shirts and all this. It, it really carries this idea of commercial Christianity. Okay, there's an idea of commercial Christianity. And so it kind of lessens it in their, in their eyes. You know what I'm saying? 
So I, myself, if you were to ask me, Stephen, what do you do? I will just wear plain clothing. Plain clothing, carry a clean Bible, and share the truth. Everything is in what you communicate. I don't need, I don't need stuff. I don't need shirts, bumper stickers. I don't, I don't need that. I don't need that. You know? And actually, a lot of that, if you really think about it, a lot of that is Western. A lot of this is Western, you know. You know, um, even just having, you know, picture, you know, it's, it's really too bad. We have pictures of Jesus, you know, images of Jesus, you know, when, when it's, it's, not, it's not preferable. It's not preferable, you know. So. so if they go into your home, you don't have a picture of Jesus? I don't. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't, yeah. So are there, are there a lot of people at the mosque? Yes. yes, yeah. And it depends which mosques. You know, some mosques are larger than others, but there's always a good amount. Yeah. There's one in Rancho Cucamonga. That one's big. Oh, my gosh, so many people in the streets. And I was just wondering where they were coming from. And they were walking to the mosque. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're all over. Um, I wanted to ask a question. You know how sometimes, let's say they invite you in their home, and you have to do exactly what they're doing. You know, in other words, you have to leave your shoes, you know, just like whatever they're doing. Is there any time that you have been invited into a, a family that where it's time for prayer, so you have to leave everything and start praying, and they, they invite you to pray, uh, I know I will not pray. I'm sorry because, you know, God is the only one I'm going to bow down to. So what would you say? I mean, if it's time for prayer, you know, this, what would you say? I mean, you know, it's time for prayer. Yeah. Say, would you like to join us in prayer? Like we do, like, you know, before the meals, we, we, we pray and bless our food. And so we mm-hmm. invite them and we pray and they're with them, you know. But what do you do? No, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I can tell you from experience. Okay, that's yeah. what I said. Yeah. Oh, Yes, yeah, so you're, you're, you're asking if they invite me to their prayer? Is that what yeah, you're asking? Yeah, they say you're at their home and it's time for prayer. Right. right. So you see all of them getting their little rug or whatever right. it is that they're doing, and they right. start bowing down and stuff, and they ask you, you know, they invite you to do the same. <clears throat> I'll say, no, no, thank you very much, but no. Right, I mean, I right. hope that will definitely say no. Yes. Um, and I hope that will not, well, I mean, you know. Yeah, so first of all, um, in all of my 13 years living in Morocco, maybe once or twice did ever a Muslim invite me to pray. They know I'm a Christian. They leave me alone. Yeah. They're, doing, they're a Muslim. So if we're having a meal or we're drinking tea or we're talking and it's time for prayer, so either they'll, they hear it. We hear it, right, in the house. If, all the mosques are, are in the loudspeakers, so they hear it, and they will say, oh, excuse me, it's time for prayer, and I'll say, sure. Oh. And they'll get up, and they'll walk, and either they will be right there in our living room, and they pull a rug out, and they say, oh, can I pray about that? I say, sure, that's fine, go ahead. And then they'll do their prayer, or they'll go into their room, or in their house, yeah, they'll do it wherever. Yeah, mm-hmm. but they will almost never invite me. If they were to ask me, ever, say, oh, come on, why don't you pray? I will say, no, I can't, I'm a Christian. I cannot say what you say because I don't believe in what you say. You know? So just love yeah. and firmness and respect. Okay. We can say a lot with love and respect yeah. and with firmness. Yeah. You know? And they respect that. If you're firm, they respect it. Because believe me, I've had a lot of conversations. They are firm. <laughs> they are firm. Yeah. So you have to be firm. Yeah. So you just have to, you know, you, you, st- you know, we, we appreciate Yeah. Care. Yeah, but they will never invite you. They will never invite you. Yeah. Do they pray for meals? No. They say Bismillah, which means in the name of Allah. So they say Bismillah, and then they eat. And then I tell them, we're going to pray. We, we like to give thanks for our food. And they'll say, oh, okay. And then they'll just, sit and they'll just listen to them, listen to me pray. Not all the time. No, not all the time. Yeah. I, I was, the last mosque I went to, 
I was with a young man outside for two hours talking, and, my, and our conversation was as it is right now, talking like this. He was very calm, very gentle. You know, so for the most part, it, it is not, for the most part, it's not like that argumentative, no. But you have all variety, yeah. you know. <laughs> so. Yes, yes, yeah, there, there have been times, yeah, there have been times. It's, I mean, and, it, and, you, and you just pray and you really leave it up to the Holy Spirit to, to do that work. And you know in your mind it's not going to happen overnight. <laughs> you know, and I'm, you know, you're praying maybe there's going to be many seeds planted, many different experiences, many occasions that I need to meet them, you know. Or maybe it's going to be that time, you know, that it's going to be the thing that they, their eyes are opened and they're convinced, you know. I've, I've spoken to people in Morocco where we shared with them and then they tell us afterwards, you know, I had a vision about this. We had a girl in Morocco that she had a dream and believe it or not, she's still a Muslim. But she had a dream and she came to our home and she was a friend of our families and she said, in this dream, I was standing in a river, a beautiful river. And there was something at my feet. And I reached down with my hands and I pulled it out of the river and it was a book. <laughs> and we said, well, which book? She said it was the Bible. She said it was the Bible. But she is still a Muslim to this day. How does that work? I don't know. You know, it's... it's oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Oh, the cost, like we said, the cost, the cost if she leaves. But God is, He's knocking, He's knocking, and she can't get rid of it. And she, and remember always, they will always see you and the Muslims that they know, and they will always compare. They're comparing in their mind. But then that means what kind of a Christian am I? What kind of a person, you know, with them or without them, I want to live a life that is worthy of the gospel, right? So, but they're looking, they're, they're examining your life, they're examining your life, you know, and that goes for everyone, everyone out there, you know, my neighbors, people who are without Christ, atheists, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormon, anyone, you know, they're examining. 